Ah, there we go. Okay, I think we're good. Excellent. We are live. All right. Thank you for your patience. Everyone is waiting in chat. Um, having some tech problems as usual. Um, we're doing some strange workarounds uh, with our, our logistics, but we'll see in a moment that we have things working as best as we can. So um, we're going to flip over to our main screen for a moment. Here you see, um, not quite yet, but you see right about now we have our special guest today. So I'd like to welcome uh, Gal uh, from Chaser Archery. Um, he's calling all the way from China, and we're very happy to have Gal as a special guest to our show. So say hello to Gal. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is Dada from Chaser yeah. Archery. So um, like for those who are just joining us, normally we do these uh, question and answer sessions where you get to ask me a bunch of questions, but recently we're getting special guests uh, with special knowledge coming in to answer specific questions. Now, um, as you can probably see right now, I've got a strange setup, so um, it, well, we can see each other kind of, but uh, we'll make this work. So um, we've prepared a few questions for Gal. Um, we'll go through our questions first, and at the end, we'll get a chance for the chat to uh, ask questions, and we can answer them uh, in a moment. So uh, let's get straight into it. Uh, Gal, thank you for coming uh, to our show. Uh, let's get started. So uh, our first question tonight is, is more about you. So how did you get into archery and what experience do you have with archery? Okay, that is a, a long story. I, <laughs> uh, first, I, it was way back to the year 20, 2011 uh, when a friend of mine, uh, he posted himself shooting a bow in a QQ group, uh, which is a chat room in China. And then for the first time I know that, I was like, this is legal? You know that uh, even knives are forbidden in China by laws. Uh, so I anticipated that uh, bows and arrows are contraband in our country. Yep. But at that very moment that I learned that they are legal. So at, the, at this very moment I decided to buy a bow and arrow. Then I went online and ordered a Chinese traditional bow and started practicing. Yep. Yep, so you, so you bought your traditional bow, and what happened afterwards? Uh, afterwards, uh, first, uh, the, in the first years, I only practiced uh, at the basement of my house. Uh, and later, I went to the archer range and I found the Olympic Raker bows. Uh, however, I didn't practice much there. Uh, and later, when I went, to, went on the Chinese domestic archery form, online form, the archersalon.com that I found there is a candle bow that called the American hunting bow, uh, which is actually the American traditional bow. Uh, well, then my favorite has become this candle bow, and I purchased all kinds of gears online. Uh, like I spent uh, more than a thousand dollars on a black tail, a little VL, mm -hmm. the one piece recurve bow. Very expensive, but beautiful wooden bow. Uh, how, uh, and later, later I, I found that uh, in, a, in a online debate, yes, right, with a domestic boyer, uh, he persuaded me that uh, the metal riser, the metal riser bow is much more superior than the wooden bow. And from that moment on, I have a dream that to achieve which is the uh, ultimate hunting bow. The ultimate hunting bow means that is a gear that is uh, unraveled in every aspect. Yep. So uh, back back to those years, uh, I practiced uh, this kind of uh, American traditional bow uh, with the uh, instinctive shooting method and uh, from the gun method by Baron Ferguson. You, you, know, you know his method. Baron Ferguson and his gap gap method of aiming. Mm -hmm. and then later, later uh, I become a manufacturer myself, uh, and I I have uh, uh, I have been into the Olympic record bows, uh, but not for my own creation or my hobby, 
is just to develop a better bow uh, by shooting it and learning from all the coaches in our country. Uh, I like uh, the coach, the coach Wang Youqun from Shanxi province. Uh, he is the oldest coach in age that is still on the front line, still working today. And I learned my uh, my uh, straight line. I learned the, the theory of straight line and how important it is uh, worth the release. Uh, he, his his uh, theory is that if you can achieve a straight line in your in, in your form, uh, then your release will naturally be clean. You don't need to pay any attention or any extra effort uh, to the release. Um, and, and I also learned a lot about the bow design series from him. Uh, he, he, he is the, uh, you know that he, he fought for our national team in the 1970s. And, and he once competed with the Mr. Sanz Begarelli. Mm -hmm. the, the, the brand Begarelli. Uh, he, he once fought, fought him in a match in the 1970s. And that's a very renowned and respected coach in our country. Uh, and and I also learned a lot from the national team coach uh, Liu Xiyuan. Yep. Uh, yep. Liu, he, he teaches me how to position my bow arm and how how to design the grip. Uh, my my grip theory is mostly from him. And other coaches like. Uh, Coach He Ying on the national team and uh, Coach uh, uh, Zhao Shenzhou, Coach, uh, 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 wait a moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they all give me a lot of education on the uh, archery form training and uh, the uh, uh, even the psycho psychology. Uh, when you're planning, when, when you're preparing for a match, and mostly the bow design. So, so Gail, can I just ask you the moment? So, uh, you, you've 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 gone through quite a lot of uh, formal training with coaches. Is that right? Uh, yes, but mostly for designing the bow rather than designing the bow myself. Actually, I have become. Uh, a small coach myself. I can coach someone. <laughs> ah. So, in terms of your experience, Gail, have you done much competition yourself, or has it just been mostly made up coaching? I I have been I have spent most of my years shooting the traditional balls, so oh. there's not much to for competition in that aspect. Oh. Because I I see the traditional ball as a hunting tool rather than a competition gear. Ah, I find it interesting that uh, you started with traditional bows and hunting bows, but you also design modern bows. And I think that will go to our next big question for you. So obviously you are um, in, in charge of uh, chaser archery and uh, manufacturing bows for a variety of purposes. Can you tell us more about your company, Chaser Archery? Uh, how did it start and what was it like in the early years? Oh uh, yes, from the from the earliest, uh, you know, my dream of uh, achieving the ultimate hunting bow, uh, I purchased quite a lot of gears. Uh, back in the year, the best metal riser uh, was uh, Hoyt Buffalo, Hoyt Tibor, and uh, mm -hmm. other manufacturers from America like Lancaster. They they built a they made a, a Tritec Titan two. You know that rather a 17 inch. Yep. Uh, a CSA machine, very beautiful. And I purchased them all. Uh, not not the Buffalo, I purchased the Tibor. Uh, and uh, with all the uh, with uh, the other bows like uh, from Beer Archery, some wooden bows. Yep. And uh, yep. my beautiful black tail. And then uh, I found them all not very satisfying. The 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 metal risers. Uh, not that they are not good, uh, but they have many aspects to for, to improve. Uh, then, after looking, uh, and there are sky sky archery, the sky archery wildfire. I yeah. almost purchased. Uh, then, then one day, 
I found uh, a familiar bo a familiar bookseller, uh, a friend of mine. He just posted a uh, a lambos for the a custom made lambos for the Hoyt Babylo and Tibor, and it's very beautiful. I have it here. Uh, can you see it? Yep. So it's a laser carved, a laser carved these images on on the surface. Yep. And I, I immediately purchased this, it's about, it cost me about, uh, how much, uh, about uh, 200 Chinese yuan. Uh, it's about, uh, that's about $15. Uh, then when I purchased this, I posted, I shared it in the children group that, uh, that uh, both other uh, held. And uh, just at that moment, the maker of this lamp boat, uh, his name is Zhang Zhen. He, he was online at that moment, and he saw my posting his rules, and he private messaged me to check uh, uh, how I like it, the feedback. Uh, and, then I, and then he found that I have a dream to build the art, to, to have, to possess the ultimate hunting boat. I haven't seen how to make it myself before that moment. And then Jonathan told me that he can make anything that I design. If I can design a boat, he can make it for me. And that, at that moment, that I, I realized that my ultimate hunting boat dream can come true. So days later, uh, after uh, a long talk, we decided to found this company. And it was the it was August, twenty fifteen. And that's how, how, how Chase Archery was founded. So that that was Chase Archery. So that was your goal of creating the ultimate hunting bow. That's why you started the company. Is that right? Yes. All right. I'm going to go backwards a bit. I was interested because you mentioned that you had experience with buying bows like the um, the Hoyt Tiburon, um, the the Tradtech uh, Titan. Um, so you mentioned that uh, these bows are very good, but there were some improvements. Um, what do you think were some of the um, improvements that could have been made to um, the bows at the time? Um... At that moment, uh, Hoyt Tiburon and Buffalo, they don't have alignment adjustment method. Ah. And that's one thing. And then it's uh, the surface, the painting, and uh, the machining. I, I don't know anything about machining by that time. Yeah. And they were not, they, they were all not to the their best uh, potential. They, I don't think they, they put the, their best into the, these products. And for the Tritech, uh, the Tritech resin, it, they are a beauty. I really like the, the Tritech, but uh, I think the, the style and the design of the bow just not match my, uh, my, my preference. Ah, I see. So, like, so looking at things some, like, the, yeah, the two things were, stuff. sorry. Yep, so the two things you said were <laughs> adjustments and style, is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, you. We we before that. Um, you you started your company. Um, so the goal was to make the ultimate, uh, hunting bow. Um, and uh, you've made a lot of things since then. We'll, we'll get back to this later, but I reckon we'll go through our next question. So uh, you started Chaser Archery. The goal was to make the ultimate hunting bow. Um, but uh, we've we've got a, a quite a few designs from the company since. So I guess I'm gonna talk about your background in terms of designing bows. So how did you get into bow design? Because most of us are into shooting, like competing or hunting or coaching. So you're into bow design, and my other question is, what background and experience do you have um, in designing bows? Uh, actually, I have a degree in. Genetics. <laughs> <Mass. laughs> uh, I'll ask how does like, how does genetics help in making a bow? A bow is an engineering design, and you have genetics. I have a new background. <laughs> All right, uh, however, uh, during my during my study at the school, uh, my university, uh, the Harvey Institute of Technology, they trained me well to be a man of science. Uh, I think that's the 
that's the only use on, on the job I have. <laughs> uh, well, uh, when we started the company, we have no designer at all. However, I, I have the passion to create this uh, ultimate hunting ball. Mm -hmm. The passion is so, it's so, I'm so obsessed with it that I think about it day and night that I can't wait to make this ball out. Uh, it's just in my head, uh, but I cannot uh, picture or, or draw it into the 3D blueprint yet. Uh, so firstly, I tried to hire some designer to do the job for me. Uh, and I tried hard, but that designer is never fun. He was never fun. Mm. Because we, we, don't, we, we not only need someone with the, a skill to uh, draw some 3D blueprint of a riser, but uh, we need him to be very patient to hear every every of my uh, to hear all my instructions on how I want the bow to be like. Um, no one can be that patient. I thought. <laughs> so this is a mission impossible. So there's only one way left that I must train myself to be a designer to do this job. Mm -hmm. So I started to take courses on the designing, uh, and uh, I just just uh, ask everyone that I meet, uh, every usher I meet, uh, for their for their uh, suggestions uh, on the bowl. And after about uh, three months, uh, I self-taught, and uh, uh, of course I took some courses, but they don't. They don't have very much. Um, I self-taught myself to use the tools to design a 3D blueprint mm -hmm. of a riser. Um, that's the three months I, I just began to to get a, get knowledge of how to use the software. Um, but it's very hard at the beginning. Um, you know that I, I studied biology, uh, yeah. microbiology, yeah. and the, and the, uh, bio, the, the molecular biology. I, I I practice in them, not in this, not in the computer, <laughs> so like this. Uh, but I think uh, it may be some something in my talent that made me learn it so quickly. Uh, and uh, after eight months, uh, in the in the year uh, 2016 April, I finally finished my first prototype design mm -hmm. of the. One riser, and we need to we need to uh, register a company uh, to apply for the patent. Uh, so me and Zhang Zhen we registered the company uh, at that moment, uh, April uh, 2016. And this is the last of my Harbor One riser in my hand. All is, the others were still out. Is that the very first one you designed? Uh, yes, the very first design. Wow. <laughs> that must be it something special to you, right? Because that's the very first thing you've gone from, like molecule genetics and, and um, <laughs> diagrams, and you've you've taught yourself. This is what I find this amazing. You've upskilled, you've trained, and you've taught yourself to design three D blueprints. And this is the yes. very first thing you designed. Yes, uh, I think uh, I think I can learn the, the software this that quick. It's because I only want to design a bow, rather than learning designing in general okay so okay. so it must be easier i guess <laughs> that's that's great so uh, that, that, that's the harvard one is that the, the right one yes the the, the harvard one and uh, i designed uh, this this first generation carved uh, lamb boats to honor this boat that make make me and john Lin know each other ah. and Decided every bow we make in the future, we will use this kind of uh, carved uh, numbers. Yeah, that, uh, that was, that was definitely um, you know when when I when I got the the python which we'll talk about later on. That was a a, 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 a hallmark. Of all the limbos are like that. Numbers. Yeah. It is good to this first generation numbers, but but uh, you you say it's all all the same lotters that I designed at the beginning. 
Yeah, and for, for those on camera, like if you have a kind of low resolution, but you can see um, in our Python videos and pictures that all the limb bolts have a lotus flower design, which is unique amongst all the uh, risers. All the bolts in all the risers are typical stainless steel bolts, but the ones made by Chase have a lotus flower, which is a very special touch um, for these designs. Um, so going back to your, your halberd, um, so you've made your, um, the first, uh, bow, uh, can you tell us more about like kind of what happened with the halberd and what happened afterwards? Uh, the halberd one, I think is, um, uh, uh, from the, the, the wheel pond of today, uh, I think it's, uh, not very mature and, uh, in my eyes now, <laughs> and at the moment I think it's a beauty. Well, it's no doubt, and it's uh, too heavy. I, I guess it's one point three kilo kilograms. Yeah, this was not the <laughs> ultimate hunting bow. Yeah, the, uh, the ultimate hunting bow was never achieved till this day. I think. Okay. I still, uh, I really, I, I may have some some new ideas. Uh, the old will be updated. Mm. All right. Like, like yep. this is the this is the Python nineteenth. This could be the, the, the modernized uh, ultimate hunting bow, I guess. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it inherited uh, most uh, some design from the uh, Harvard One, like this piece. This piece is the, uh, I call it uh, the, uh, in English it should be called double radius shelf. Okay. It's okay. removable, and if it's removed, you have three plugger holes here. You say three. You could use a plugger at the bottom hole and with the uh, with the four four shelf, oh, the four shelf, and you can use the two plugger holes as the normal retro bow. So uh, and with, uh, what I'm saying there, so what you said was there are three holes uh, for the plunger. Yes. So, you, so that means you can shoot off the shelf with the plunger. Yes. Oh, okay. And if uh, if I attach this, if I just stop the radius shelf on. Mm -hmm. Then you shoot off the shelf with both sides covered in four. Okay. You see that because it's curved, so it's a so it's a perfect uh, traditional American bow. Hmm. That's interesting. Um. So. And it's, yeah. Is this suppose here? Oh, okay, I see that. Yep, it's removable. That's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you've, you've talked about the, the halberd one and you've learned quite a few things about the design materials and shape and uh, we'll move ahead to our, our next one. So you've gone from designing like hunting bows and um, you know, one of the things you're known for now is designing uh, Olympic style uh, bows, oh, like the, the python, right? So uh, how did you go from like making like, the halberd and the hunting bows to making the python and the target bows? Uh, it's... Uh... It's after I uh, learned the designing the designing skills. Uh, it's early in the twenty sixteen, uh, or at the end of the twenty fifteen. Uh, it's, it's well before I finished the design of Harvard One that I started my project of Python. Uh, it's the twenty fifth twenty five inch uh, Olympic record present. Uh, the reason why I started this is because that when I dig up in the history of uh, modern bow development, uh, I found that uh, the Olympic record bow derives from English longbow. Mm -hmm. And um, with, the, with all the history that I see how the bow evolves, uh, with all the years from Yamaha, Hoyt, and San Mike, um, I found that it's it's quite fascinating. It's it's just like uh, the the tech tree of tanks in War Thunder, you know. <laughs> and then then I, I, I found that I must um, also make a this bow because a hunting bow, a hunting bow is uh, not for competition of course, and it doesn't uh, represent the the highest technology and the development of uh, of bows today. Uh, so uh, and of course. Uh, I watched uh, many of the uh, Olympic uh, archery shooting videos, and some and the uh, uh, also the uh, World Archery Series mm -hmm. competitions. Mm -hmm. And when 
when the, the final victory was achieved, when the Korean coach yells, turn! Oh, it should be turn! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that moment, that moment that it just got me. That the, the glory moment and the happiness that when, when the archery should, uh, should attend and get victory. Uh, of course, I know that I am never to get that glory myself, uh, as many of us too. Uh, but I find that if my bow can go to that competition and get a victory, that I can share some of the glory myself. Wow. So that got, um, and my dream has shifted from the ultimate counting bow to the ultimate liquor bow. Wow, that's a, that's a great story. Like I know some of us, like you know, we cut. You're right. We, we we dream or we kind of have a fantasy of reaching that glory of getting like ten, 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 winning gold medals. And some of us do it as athletes. Some of us do it as coaches. But you're living this dream as a bow designer. Yes, yes. If my bow got a medal, it it just like me get him. That's that's amazing. Uh, that's great. In most, I'm working it. Great. Um, and like speaking of which, like, uh, ha have you had any successes? Like, have any? Um, have you won? Uh, has your bow won like national tournaments or, um, you know, achieved good results? Uh, no, my, myself, I didn't shoot in any competition actually, mm. um, because most of my practice was in the uh, hunting ball, uh, the traditional. <laughs> well, this this is this is a dream that that come to my come to my mind that I think I can put it. Uh, as my goal, uh, as my uh, personal goal or, or goal of my life or something. So uh, I just went on to design it. And later in, in, the, uh, in the years, uh, 2016, uh, maybe earlier, uh, I met my friend uh, Wang Kun. Uh, he was a bearable shooter at the moment and uh, a renowned one. He got several uh, national champions himself, and he is a well-connected man. Uh, he introduced myself. He introduced me to the national coaches and led me in the into the circle. So when I met all those coaches, and they are so uh, friendly and uh, uh, eager to help, uh, so I am very moved by this, and I think I must make something that uh, for them, for their athletes to use, to make them proud. Because I also see that uh, none of the Chinese made uh, brand, Chinese brand bowls uh, were never were, were ever used in the, uh, in the Olympic or in the uh, national competitions like uh, the World Archery, yep. uh, the, the, the Archery World Cup. So my goal is to make them the Chinese bowl that they can make they, they can use as a Chinese in the competition. So that's also a national pride in it. Mm. And, uh, do so, you, sorry, just, just to uh, interrupt there. Uh, um, so you said like this is uh, obviously uh, most of the bows in the competition are Korean or American. Um, yes. And you know, making a, a Chinese made bow is important. Um, has the Chinese team or are there many Chinese athletes which uh, have they adopted um, you know, Chinese brands like Chaser? Uh, no, at the moment, uh, uh, because uh, in our, our country, the uh, the national team was run by the government, yep. and all the coaches, uh, they are like officials. Uh, they make decisions very carefully because they they, they must uh, uh, they are responsible uh, to their superiors and uh, to the country. So if uh, someone approaches them and that tell them there's a there's a China made bow that uh, is very good, you should try them. They almost certainly have doubts on it. They, they can't risk their, their athletes to, to drop their, uh, their scores or, or something. Um, it was all due back to the day that, uh, that uh, I gave uh, Miss Fang Yuting, uh, who is the uh, London Olympic uh, team silver medal owner, one nigga. So, uh, then okay. he tried, she tried my bow yep. and uh, yep. found that it's not bad. And she got her personal best 
uh, in the coming week. Uh, although it's, it was in practice, not in a competition. But this this uh, shattered their uh, their thought on the on the on the domestic made both. So my ball was uh, then tried by several uh, coaches and their athletes. And then now I have about seven athletes using my ball in the na uh, on the national team and on the provincial team. That's a, that's a good win already. I mean, like we're going from like you know uh, trying to uh, you know make your bow the ultimate recurve bow, and now people in the national team are, 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 are the provisional team are using it. I just want to actually clarify this because this is I didn't know this. I thought this was really fascinating. So, um, in in most countries, uh, the athlete to shoot at national or international level, um, they mostly choose their own equipment. And uh, I was interested that you said that uh, because. Um, the national coach is held responsible for the team's performance. That um, th does does the coach have a lot more control over what the athletes use? Uh, yes, they, they mostly the coach can advise they use something, oh. but as uh, him or herself uh, can deny it with one vote. Okay, that's interesting. That, that's um, because it's it's something that's again like we have so much more freedom in choosing what we want to use, but having that strong advice or that decision making from the coach that was an interesting thing I didn't know about. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, is there anything else we want to talk? Oh, actually, no. Let's talk about the bow. So um, we're going through our notes here, and uh, like one of the things which this is probably more interesting to many people watching is um specifically talking about designing so when, you, when you're designing a bow like you know a hunting bow or a recurve bow and this is going to make it a little scientific and engineering like perhaps but um uh, maybe explain to us in, in a, perhaps an easy way like when you design a bow like when you imagine a bow like the python or you imagine the ultimate recurve bow what factors go into a good bow design uh, let me get to my notes first. <laughs> <laughs> this is called, we have this like, like, 10 page list of notes. <laughs> I wasn't that long, but uh, we have a lot of things here. This is where I, I really wanted to bring Gal on board because, as a designer himself, um, he's, still, he's self taught, but he's very accomplished in achieving some very good designs. Uh, this is where we can see some of the expertise shine through. Um, so, again, the question was uh, what, what were some of the factors in designing a good Rico uh, bow? Uh, the factors, uh, I think uh, the most I want to mention is the uh, rigidity uh, versus flexibility. You know, that uh, the rigidity is that uh, the bow, the riser itself, turned now to deform when, uh, when put on the stress, when put on the jaw weight. It, it turns now to deform. Uh, then you can call it rigidity, rigid, rigid or uh, stiff. Of stiffness. You see that? Um, the stiffness, it can make the riser stay unchanged during the draw and the release. That makes uh, the riser participate less in the elastic energy mm. uh, stoppage. And just, to, just to clarify to you, for the people watching, because like, you might not notice this when you shoot a bow, because most bows that you buy are pretty well designed. But we're talking about rigidity or stiffness. The bow is under a lot of tension, a lot of pressure, right? So when you're pulling a full draw, if the bow is poor designed, it will twist, right? Now, how, how like, for... Not only twist, but yeah. also elastic changing at yeah. this, uh, this direction. Ah, yes. It's like, uh, it's like uh, a softer... You can you can think of uh, it's if it was made in a softer material. Mm. Uh, lamps itself, you have a lamp this long, then this part will bend. Right. It means if a riser is not rigid enough, it will participate in the in the energy storage of yep. the bow. Yep. However, aluminum metal, this material, they are less efficient in the storage of uh, elastic potential energy. So if, if more energy was saved in the riser, then it's less efficient in the in the uh, in the conversion to the to the energy to the kinetic energy of the arrow. Right. So that's right. that's that's one aspect of why rigidity is important. Understood. The second is more obvious. It's the cell window. 
The side window is asymmetric. So when you pull the bow, it will generate a, a torque uh, that makes the makes the riser, the, the upper part to flex to to turn on on this direction. To rotate on this direction. Yep. Yep. Well when you release well well this this torque it generates uh, that the bow if the bow is flexed, the riser is flexed first, this lamp this lamp pocket, it will flex too. Yep. Then the lamps yep. will not be aligned as when you're not draw the riser. When you're not draw the bow. It will be misaligned. Uh, and second, uh, when you release the riser will uh, flex to the opposite position, opposite direction, yes. and rotate, yes. and and it will generate a, a force on the arrow and affects yes. a horizontal uh, precision. So as the stiffness of the of the riser is very important in these two aspects. Uh, well, however, st uh, rigid or stiffness uh, is not only uh, it's not the only thing that uh, is needed, but also flexibility. You know what? Flexibility, it means the razor, uh, it means everything that opposite I just said. It will, the, the razor will bend, will deform uh, with the lamps that are drawn. But this will generate what? Will generate a ejection effect when, when released. The bow will, uh, uh, it's not only that less rigid bows will, ge will generate this, uh, this ejection field, but the end heavy, the end heavy bows, when the end is more heavy than the middle, the two ends more heavy, then it tends to uh, generate an ejection effect. The bow will, the bow will just eject from the hand. Okay. Then, then this will generate uh, some feel, some personal uh, preference uh, favored by some athletes. This can also affect their performance. So, so that's why uh, there are many manufacturers these days. They are using the uh, the end heavy designs that, that distribute weight to the to the both ends mm. rather than the middle. So this uh, this seems uh, to although this is contradictory to each other, but they needs to be balanced in the designing of the ball. Uh, however, uh, we chase archery, uh, we choose to to honor rigid as a priority mm -hmm. in our design because we uh, th there, there was a saying that letting the ball shoot himself uh, shoot itself let, letting the ball shoot itself uh, that that should be eliminate uh, human in interference. In, in the shooting, uh, but we developed that theory into uh, let the lambs shoot itself, uh, just to eliminate the, eliminate the razor's interference in the lambs. So ah. that's our. However, this theory cannot be proved uh, with uh, with figures or, or some data, but it can be proved by the the shooting feeling uh, by the athletes. Ah, that's that's really interesting. I, I didn't understand too much about the details about what goes in the bow design. I find it really fascinating to talk about how... I, I liked how you talked about the, the ends being heavy. That's something which uh, I talk about a lot when comparing risers. So some risers are like middle heavy, uh, some are more balanced, and some are more balanced towards the ends. This hand heavy, this hand heavy can be adjusted uh, mm -hmm. with just putting weights yep. to this part or this part. You just... You just put weights on the end. Yeah. You see, and I have bushings here. Uh, that is how I, I how I many how I want to resolve this problem. If you want the, the heavy ends, then you can add weights in this two in these four. Mm. Then it do have a better ejection feel when you put weights on them. Mm. It's adjustable. Mm. However, uh, that will make the riser more heavy, of course. But uh, if you just put the, the weights in the riser itself, then it will not be adjustable. It will just only be a uh, unheavy riser, not not adjustable. But uh, if you don't, if you put it uh, put the rigidity in priority, then 
So adjustment method can resolve this problem. Mm, now, while you're holding um, the Python right there, I've got another question which we didn't really talk about, but um, this is because people watching this might be used to traditional bows and they're not used to seeing a modern aluminium bow with the fancy shapes and cutouts. Can we hold the bow for a minute there? Um, can you explain um, like what goes into like the design? You've got all these shapes and cutouts and obviously there's a lot of engineering involved. How do you decide what it looks like? <laughs> Uh, it is from uh, the uh, the tool that I used, uh, the mechanical tool. Uh, it was once when I learning the designs. Uh, I met an uh, engineer online, and he told me uh, he was doing the uh, the wheel hubs for the automobiles. Yep. He was designing those the, the, the wheel hubs, uh, which is the aluminum wheel of the of the vehicle. Okay. Uh, and he taught me a method of the, the of topology. Topology, you know, uh, the the science of the shape. And and uh, with that, uh, he taught me the tools of finite uh, element analysis. Uh, it will analysis the uh, the inner the inner stress distribution of a design of a shape. So with that, with his method, uh, I developed a theory that if we can eliminate all the uh, inner stress concentration concentration zones of the design, then we can make the bow more rigid. Because it, it means every part, every bit of my material in the riser, in the structure, they will share equal stress when added a load. Uh, that means uh, every piece is uh, put to use, equally efficient. So it will be a very, uh, very weight and uh, strength uh, uh, efficient. Mm. Uh, so I use that tool. Uh, that tool is uh, I, I can do it myself because it's very professional tools uh, that only the engineer he can he can use that. So I outsource it. I outsource all my. Uh, all my analysis to him. Uh, I spent a lot of money, of course. <laughs> and he, he gave me the topology uh, advices, and uh, I changed, I, I, I corrected the, the design based on his advice. Ah. This, uh, this process, you, you, you design a prototype, he do the analysis, and spend some money. And uh, give me feedback, and I, I change, I edit it, um, just back and forth, and then finally I, I achieved a point that uh, the whole design there is nearly zero concentration zones of stress. That is the Python. Ah. So it looks like this. So like the whole process started from understanding um, wheel wheels, right? The wheel design. Yes. Ah, okay. And I'd imagine like there'd be some software and testing to see the stress points, and that's how you improve the design. Is that right? Yes. Ah. Uh, actually, serial I don't know that uh, how the other manufacturers design on their books, but this is the method I found that I could use, ah. and I, I put it to test later with the with the samples, and it turns out very good. Mm. Well, that's amazing. Now we we we'll talk more about bow design. So uh, talk about, talk about uh, materials. So uh, when choosing the materials you use to make uh, like a Python, um, how did you come about selecting the material that you end up using? Uh, actually, uh, when I set up the the initial principles of the design, uh, the rigid the rigidity, uh, uh, prior prior to the flexibility, I need the bow to be rigid, and rigid means the material must have a better, uh, higher yield stress. So the 7075 aluminum comes to to my side um, almost immediately because it's the uh, most, uh, it's the strongest uh, with the most uh, yield stress uh, that we can purchase and um, and do in the in the civilian uh, industries. Of course, there are military aluminum that we cannot get our hands on. 
Well, this, uh, the 7075 has a yield strength of uh, 505 MPA. Uh, well, the normally used 661 only have 276 MPA. That means uh, that, that that converts to to English or human human words is to is that uh, with the same stress put on on the riser, uh, it will uh, deform about half uh, as the as the sixty sixty one does. So that's the statements I wanted. So, uh, but however, uh, at the moment I design Python, uh, there are only uh, like uh, three manufacturers use the 7075, uh, which is MK Korea and Stolid 2. Uh, and Favix once used it on one of their product, but they discontinued it. Okay. Uh, so okay. I, I have no idea whether this will really be better. So I constructed uh, uh, samples based on the very same design. And tested them, and the test result turns out very good. Uh, the seventy the seventy seventy five, uh, not alone is more rigid, but it it absorbs more shock because the material is is shock absorbing. And with these findings, that I decided that our Python should use this material. I should point out to you that uh, my first impression when shooting the Python was exactly that. It felt so soft, like the, the absorption was so good. And when I gave it to other people to try, um, it immediately, it just felt different to even though we've tried before. Uh, I'm not trying to sell the Python here, but uh, I use it currently for a good reason. Um, it mentioned that one of our club members, Thorin, he bought his right away. Like the moment he touched it, he wouldn't give it back, <laughs> so he had to borrow it himself right away, and that was a really amazing thing because, like like Gal said, um, like not many companies use um, this material, um, and the the feedback was so different. It felt so satisfying that uh, it was hard to explain without that engineering background. It's hard to explain why it works, but uh, it definitely has that shock absorption effect, and the vibrations felt so dampened that it it, it didn't need much. Uh, more weight or adjustment, so uh, I think the design really has um, a lot of positive impact. We mentioned guy before talking about how we can't necessarily prove it, but the feeling we get when shooting it can definitely give us the right feedback. So um, that, that's a really, a really interesting to hear about. Um, so uh, let's do moving moving sideways a bit here. So um, the 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 Python was actually uh, uh in terms of pricing on the higher end and. Um, one of the questions people ask about a lot, and uh, this will be relevant to you as well, is um, you know a lot of people want to spend a very low amount on on bows. Um, so, from your experience and from your understanding of bow design, what are some of the the big differences between um, you know cheap uh, risers and expensive risers? Uh, this is a question that uh, I should I should talk about deeply. Uh, first, uh, I think it all all on the cost. The cost is uh, the cost has two different aspects. One is for marketing. One is for a marginal uh, manufacturing cost. It means uh, if you produce uh, one more of the product, the cost of that part, uh, it doesn't include any design or marketing or, or anything like that. It's just the manufacturing cost. Uh, that Python, in particular, is manufacturing cost very much. Because we use the five axes in machining, it gives us a, a tolerance of 0 0.02 millimeters. Actually, our goal wasn't that, wasn't that good at the beginning. We only aimed at 0 0.05 millimeters, but uh, the machining, they, they really did very good job and gave us that uh, tolerance. Mm -hmm. That's incredible incredible tolerance to me. Because it's 25 inch long, and these two holes, these two lamp holes, they miss a line to the center line by only 0 0.02 millimeters. Uh, and that oh. is achieved by spending more money on the machining. So this is one of the Big difference between the the, the uh, expensive and cheap riders. The cheap riders they can be 
a misaligned up to about one millimeter, uh, or even or even bigger. Or even you can you can you can see it with your bare hand, with your bare ass. That is bad. Mm. A cheap razor can can be can be that bad, uh, because the cheap razors, uh, the the very cheap razors. I'm talking about cast die casted razors like the magnesium aluminum. Uh, they will bend. They will bend naturally. They will naturally be bent because the process uh, of die casting uh, it it generates inner stress. Inner stress will mean that when you when you withdraw the uh, the mold, the mold yep. then it will bend immediately. And with the with time, with with the, the temperature drops, it will bend more. And it usually needs correction after that processing. A correction is definitely needed. A correction, but but the correction won't won't correct it too into a too accurate uh, status. And, and would that mean too? So, like talk about uh, the die cast uh, rises. Does that also mean that these um, die cast rises are more inconsistent? Is that is that what the problem is? Uh, the problem actually is that. Inconsistence on the misaligned uh -huh. center of that will make the adjustment of the of the center line very difficult. Uh, uh, yeah. And the other thing is that uh, the razor will uh, generate uneven unevenly uh, stress uh, during the draw, and then it it performs not uh, it will will not be consistent at each draw. And just for those watching too, this is important because a lot of people ask about bow tuning and bow setup. And one of the things which um, a lot of people ask about is limb alignment. So because of the offset um, of the top and bottom limbs, uh, some people have to spend a lot of time getting exactly right. But uh, we mentioned before the Python that some of the rods and the Python are so consistent in that there's so little difference in the top and bottom limb. That you can pretty much put the limbs on and shoot right away, and there's no need for tuning. So it solves a lot of problems because that people don't recognize that even a slight fraction of a millimeter off center can create that suboptimal performance. That can really hamper um, your accuracy and precision. And that's something people, especially beginners, aren't very familiar with. So investing in a in a very expensive riser can actually mitigate that problem immediately. Uh, I don't think I've actually tuned my uh, my limb alignment for the Python. Never had problems. Uh, they're just so good out the box, and that's one big difference. Actually, the the cheap razors have their merits too. Mm. Uh, the cheap razors, uh, like the 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 first, their their design is different. Mm. They are designed to be more flexible. Uh, their cutouts may be bigger, and and their la their their uh, bow arms may be thinner. And the narrower, so that uh, it it is lighter in weight. Uh, for beginners to intermediate shooters, uh, the light weight of the riser seems more important than the accuracy or precision of, it. Uh, because their stress hasn't hasn't been built up yet. Mm. And that's the very very important merit that that people should buy the cheap risers at the beginning of their training. Mm, okay. So because the, the expensive razors, they are, they, uh, they mostly are stiff uh, and uh, heavy than the cheap ones. Mm. So just to summarize that, we went through a few things there. So some of the differences were things like the, the method of manufacture. So the cheaper razors are more like die cast, or those which use machine uh, aluminum, they use like three axes compared to five axes. So the expensive risers. Uh, <laughs> Yep, the they, they need access machining to, to cut these lamp bolts, uh, yep. these uh, lamp pockets. Yep, okay, so much more precise manufacturing, um, the materials used, and you mentioned marketing as well, so cheaper risers uh, might not be marketed as heavily, so the cost uh, yes. is much lower. Yes, marketing cost is, is, is actually very huge in mm. this, in this. Uh, and that is what we are, we are doing bad in. Okay. We don't spend much in the marketing, so... Uh, our main problem is is uh, most of the people don't know that we exist. Mm. And just, just, just for those that chase very well, um, so what, what countries or what shops have you managed to reach out to? 
uh, actually we we don't have we don't have uh, uh, very much abroad uh, distribution network. Uh, actually, only uh, some online shops and uh, uh, some small clubs in Europe uh, carry okay. our okay. product. And in China, we also uh, we also sell them directly online rather than uh, mass uh, rather mass marketing or distributing on the offline uh, the clubs. Okay. Mm, I think that moves on to our, our next question. So uh, we, we talked about some of the, the challenges with um, Chinese uh, companies and manufacturers developing their own designs uh, versus the more established uh, companies which design both in Korea or in, uh, in, the, in the West. So um, my question is, like, what, are some of the, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on how you know, Chinese manufacturers are developing, especially these modern target risers? Um, and do you think there might be a, a large demand for uh, growth in Chinese archery um, companies and manufacturing? I think that definitely will. It definitely will grow uh, in the future. And in the and now, there are many more companies that, that are making good stuff uh, these days mm. for, for the community. Mm. Uh, back, back, year, back in the years, they may... Uh, Make some. They may have made some uh, cheap stuff. Uh, that is because no marketing or designing was put in it. Ah. Uh, but, but with the development of years, especially uh, these, uh, it started in 2012. That archery was uh, was blooming in China. The domestic market. Uh, they get a lot of money from there. And so the manufacturers, uh, although they uh, derive from factories, they, that they found that uh, both can make the money, and the factories tend to turn from other products to both. Uh, that's uh, most of the Chinese manufacturers start. Uh, uh, quite contrary to us, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I find it interesting that the two things I've noticed, like in the, in the last few years, especially in my line of work online, is or well, firstly, um, like you mentioned before, uh, the the low cost of marketing, if any cost. Uh, I think many of the, the popular bows which are sold from China or made in China, um, they're mostly sold online through eBay or through um, Alibaba, AliExpress. Even Wish sells a lot of the same Chinese bows, and um, there's no marketing. Like people just buy it because it's really cheap, and they're really, really popular yes. for that reason. So, that says the the only marketing back then. Yeah, so <laughs> just just having low prices and you know thousands just buying it. That's the, that's their marketing. That's the interesting approach to to save money on on marketing. It's just to make it really cheap in the first place. So, that's interesting, and um, I've also noticed that trend too. Like like you said, that uh, more Chinese companies are starting to expand into more of the high end or intermediate um, risers. I've noticed quite a few like you know normally cheap brands have stepped up and designed very modern um, designs. So um, that's an interesting trend I've noticed. Uh, so that's. To me, something which I think we'll we'll see in the future. Um, and speaking of the future, uh, so this is kind of your thoughts again. Um, what do you think about the future of bow design? Uh, what changes or what technologies do you think will will change the face of archery in the future? The first thing coming to mind is the use of new material, uh, like uh, the seventeen ninety seventeen ninety aluminum. That's a super aluminum that uh, we can actually get my get our hands on. Mm. Uh, I'm testing it uh, as we speak, uh, and but but it, it may need some some time that I can conclude whether it is suitable for razor building. It may not because uh, although it has more stress, but um, uh, it uh, may be more fatigue. Uh, and and uh, the other thing is uh, titanium aluminum, uh, titanium, not aluminum, titanium alloy. Uh, that titanium alloy, I have dream, I have uh, uh, tried to make uh, something like that uh, in years back. Uh, however, that I uh, I find it uh, not quite practical to make because the uh, machining is too costly. Uh, however, there is an Italian company called Tie Razor. You probably have 
notice uh, Tyrus, they made out uh, some some prototypes, and that's awesome and impressive. Um, I very admire them. That uh, that I gave up ty the titanium riser uh, years ago, but they made it out. <laughs> Yeah. However, we still need to see how, how it performs and whether it is um, uh, a future a future way to go. Uh, however, the titanium riser uh, is not the performance; it's the it's the cost is too high. That I just cannot, cannot uh, it may cost uh, up to a thousand uh, ten thousand U.S. dollars. <laughs> just what? But it's not for the riser, just just a ten thousand dollar riser. Because, because uh, the machining, the machining, the, the the titanium alloy, it will react with the uh, with the uh, the machining gears, and so it will be uh, the gears will will, will be abraced, and uh, it will not be precision precise enough to to generate the the tolerance we need. So it it, it may also uh, mean that we we need to make several riders to have one that is qualified. So that's the cost uh, from. And titanium alloy is it, always it's also very expensive in material, mm -hmm. of course. Wow. So uh, yeah, if if it wants to send me a ten thousand dollar titanium riser, feel free to uh, contact me. <laughs> My question for you in chat watching this is: Would you spend ten thousand dollars on a riser? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the the tyrizer from Ital from Italy. Um, I don't think they they made it that uh, that expensive. So they must have some way to to have a breakthrough on this problem. Mm, okay. <laughs> no, knowing me, yeah, knowing most people, I I tell people you should buy a very good riser and buy cheap limbs. I just imagine somebody having a ten thousand dollar titanium riser with the cheapest limbs on it. <laughs> That would be a terrible waste of a, of a, of a riser, but <laughs> that's, that's funny. Okay, so uh, that's a really interesting, again, looking through um, at some future technology and materials. That was a really big focus. Um, I, I think we're near the end of our, our show. It's been a good session so far. Um, we're going to give chat a chance to uh, ask questions for those who are in chat right now. It's only a few of us, but if you have any questions for Gao, just while we are finishing our stream, feel free to ask in the next five or so minutes. Um, okay, let, let me check it. Uh, yep. there, there's so many chats. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a few. People talk about other things, which is great too. I think one of the questions which we had before was, uh, what are some of the biggest markets for archery? I think the question for Europe, but I think we're talking talk about worldwide. Like, well, where are the, the people buying archery gear? Like, what markets, from what, from what you know, what countries are people from who are buying bows mostly? Uh, I think... Uh... Well, most of my products were were, were purchased in the, by the domestic China market, mm -hmm. uh, but someone from Americans, from America and the uh, Australia, of course, and Europe, and they all have we, we all have some clients there, mm -hmm. but not very many as we didn't spend much in the marketing. People don't know our existence. Mm. I find that one of the really interesting my side is that there's a bit of a a gap between like the Western market and the Asian market. And I find people who are contacting me about uh, different bows and cheap models. They're mostly from Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, of course. So we have this this group of countries in Southeast Asia which mostly buy domestic products, mostly on uh, online. Um, so there are very few archery stores in these countries that buy mostly online. And then you have like the more Western side, like uh, America and Europe and Australia. For buying uh, from you know stores, it's like tradable for us to and to buy. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um. And just while we're waiting for any more questions over there, it's my audio too level. Uh, too late now to vote. <laughs> I think my 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 microphone's too soft, but we'll fix it later. Um. So I think I guess we'll we'll wrap up with one final question, which we prepared earlier, and that is um. Uh, where are we? So. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is going to, who wants to like do what you do? So things like design and work in the archery industry. This obviously isn't something which many people do, but what advice would you have for someone who has the skill or the training, or especially for you, the passion to maybe design a bow or to work in the industry? What advice would you give to them? 
Uh, well, the the most important was that uh, if you have the passion as like me, or you have the skills uh, better than me, I, I think maybe some some someone some people they already learn the designing or or mechanics or or maybe they are engineers themselves. But if they want to make a top end boat uh, like Python, like like what we did, they must prepare a, a huge amount of money. To do that, lots of money. <laughs> it's not money. Wow, we cannot. Okay. Oh, we we barely survived in the past uh, two years uh, because uh, I spent all my savings and my, my partner Zhang Jin he spent all his savings too, and uh, we took some loan from the banks because because Python is just too expensive to sell. That that uh, I know that this is a top band razor, but. It will take quite some effort to persuade people to believe that. Mm. So that that is money that should be spent on marketing, because we didn't spend money on marketing that the the products don't don't go fast. So the money is very intense for us. Wow, so uh, like, no, no, no kidding, right? So starting a company from scratch and designing things is a lot of investment. And uh, what you said about marketing is something I've seen in other industries as well, so things like performing arts and creative arts. People have a really good idea, maybe a product design, maybe a shop or a service, sometimes even like a film or a TV series. They spend all the money on production, but they have nothing left over for marketing. And that's this one, yeah. all pertains to the development. On production, and somehow you have to sell this thing. Remember that. <laughs> okay. It's, it's wow. More it's okay. more difficult to sell a rather than to uh, make one. Mm. Oh, that's that's amazing. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. I think we we're, we're kind of running out of questions. Um, I think what will happen is that um, of course, you know, once the uh, live stream goes on YouTube, more people will come back and watch it. And I think Gal will be very happy to answer any questions we have. So if you have a question for Gal and for Chaser Archery, feel free to post a question in the comment section below, um, and we'll pick it up and we'll answer those later on. Um, I want to say thank you to you, Gail, for coming along. It's been a very insightful conversation, especially for a topic which many of us don't know about, which is design and what's ha happening behind the scenes in designing a bow from scratch. Um, so again, thank you, Gail, for joining us. Thanks, thanks all. It's my honor. <laughs> it's been very good. And of course, if you want to find more information about Chaser Archery, all the bows they have, um, where can we find more about Chaser Archery? Uh, uh, now this uh, our website is under construction, but you can just follow us on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com uh, dash chaser archery. Excellent. Okay, we'll li we'll link the website and the Facebook page in the description as well. So again, thank you, Gav, for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this live stream. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned a lot in terms of bow design. I know a lot of things which I assumed I thought I knew, but. Having this uh, engineering and scientific background has helped me a lot too. Hopefully you found it enjoyable yourself. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. And again, thank you to Gal. We wish you all a very good day or night wherever you are. And hopefully we'll tune in next time for our next Q&A. See you all next time. See you.